In this episode, I'm joined by conductor Michelle Merrill. She's worked with orchestras like the National Symphony, the Milwaukee Symphony, the Dallas Symphony, the Iceland Symphony, and San Francisco Opera, among many others. For four years, she was the assistant conductor of the Detroit Symphony and is currently music director of the Coastal Symphony of Georgia. She tells us all about the life of a conductor, what she does, how she got her start in music, and we also have a rapid-fire question round. Welcome, Michelle Merrill. It's great to have you on Classical Breakdown. Thanks, John. Great to be here. So you're in town conducting the National Symphony Orchestra, and in fact, you'll be here several times this season, right? That's right. I'm here again in February for a family concert, and then we have a couple more education shows that are happening in April and then May. Okay, so you and I have performed together several times before, but let's pretend we've never met, (laughs) and I'm not even a musician. (laughs) How would you describe to me what you do, like an elevator speech. Sure. Uh, Well, you know, being a conductor, I think, is kind of an enigma for a lot of people. And even some of my very best friends don't understand what it is I do or what the point of me even being up there is. So I basically like to tell people, especially if I'm with a room full of people, what would it be if all of you tried to say hello at the same time? And of course, it's just a big jumbled mess. And so... It's really my job with the 60, 80, 100, however many musicians on stage to first and foremost get everybody to play together at the same time in the same tempo um, and hopefully uh, kind of with the same flow and and start to a piece. So I think that is the number one thing that, you know, you've got to be there to do that when you have that many people on stage. But really it goes so much beyond that because – I'm shaping not only this tempo of the piece, but hopefully imparting kind of the flow, the phrasing, the way that uh, we might want to bring out dynamics, which is what we're talking about when we talk about the loudness or the softness of a piece. And I'm just trying to really make the music be what is on the page, come out in life and, and what we might hear in the concert hall. And what's so great about conductors is it's kind of like... People have their favorite chefs, and why do we go to those chefs? They use different ingredients. They use different spices to bring out certain flavors. And I think conductors do the same thing with music, is we bring out different colors, different uh, uh, emotions, hopefully different phrasings in the music, even though the instructions are right there, just like a recipe, we're hopefully bringing it to life in in new and interesting ways. Wow. This has been a long elevator ride. (laughs) But that is the average person, I think, um, especially if they're not super familiar with music, it's kind of like the conductor is this, for better or for worse, this kind of mystical music genius divine kind of on a pedestal. You can't, you know, and I don't want to ruin that perception (laughs) for you, but to a lot of people, it is kind of, you know, you're waving your arms around in a concert and it seems kind of grandiose, but audiences don't see all of the work that happens beforehand. Of course, yeah. The conductor's main job is happening in the rehearsals that are that are preceding the concert. For me, I'm always most, and I won't say nervous, but most anxious before a first rehearsal. I'm almost never anxious by the time it's a concert because then you've been with the musicians, you've been hashing it out, you've been working, you've been uh, slaving away at, at doing things and, and making things right. And then the concert is just a time to enjoy and have fun and play with those things that you've done. But it's those first rehearsals right before, especially if it's a if it's a new orchestra that I haven't worked with before, figuring out how you're all going to collaborate together to get this music to happen. So let's break down what you do as a conductor. Um, let's think of like a hypothetical concert. It's happening in the future. Um, tell us maybe how far in advance that would be and what is like the first thing that happens in preparation or I guess deciding on a concert? Sure. Uh, Well, a lot of times you get contacted by an orchestra uh, about a year in advance, sometimes two years in advance, and they, you know, ask if you're free for those available dates. And then they might have a concept in mind of a concert you would want they would want to do which is actually what happened with the National Symphony is they had this idea that they wanted to do a concert that was celebrating the 19th Amendment women's suffrage which is celebrating its 100th year and so we started for months and months and months kind of just 
throwing ideas into a drop box of different pieces that could be done, uh, how we wanted the concert to flow, because this is for children and we're trying to find this uh, a way to magnify kind of these great female composers in light of women's suffrage and, you know, the kind of the power of women in general. And so there was a lot of debate uh, and discussion on how to pick different pieces and, and which pieces were significant and what we should do for a different type of concert. If it's just a, a strictly classical concert, a lot of times that's that's up to me to kind of figure out what pieces that I would want to do. You might have a soloist that's already been selected for that same concert and they might have a piece that they've already uh, been doing. I'm going in a couple of weeks to Evansville, Indiana and playing there with one of the winners, I think, of the Indianapolis violin competition. And he's going to be doing Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. So when I was helping to pick this program about a year ago, I submitted all sorts of different ideas of pieces that I thought would go well with that. So it's always fun. You never do the same types of pieces together normally. And uh and again, it's it, I, I like foods. So maybe that's why I relate it to food a lot. It's like having a meal. You might have a great steak uh, and pair it with a wine or pair it with an appetizer, but you're never necessarily going to have that same meal again twice. And, and it's nice to explore different musics with different pairings. So it's like a year in advance. You Now you've decided on the music. You know what you're going to play. What happens next? You have scores, right? You get all the music and you have all the parts in them. How do you then go forward in preparing that? Sure. So I always say about 85 to 90 percent of a conductor's job is just sitting in a room by themselves looking at the music, the score in our case, which has all of the different musical parts on it. So whereas the flute part, it's only the music and the notes that the flute is playing. I see the flute's part, the oboe's part, the clarinet's part, all the way down through the the cellos and the basses. And um, just kind of seeing how those line up on the page. I'm really nerdy because my teacher's mother was a librarian. And whenever she had new books, she would always open them up and straighten them out. And so he told me this. And now every single time I get a new score, I open it up, I straight. And there's something about the smoothing out of the pages that is very like it's it's exciting because I'm about to learn a new piece. Or if it's if it's an old piece, I don't have to do that. But sometimes, especially when it's a piece I haven't worked on before, it's it's con- kind of like getting to know it. I'm looking at the page, I'm looking at how the notes are laid out on the page. And then I go through and I, uh, I, I, I normally will give it a listen. I like to listen to things in lots of different recordings, if there is a recording of it, right at the beginning. And then I almost always kind of never listen to it again because I want to not let those recordings influence my own interpretation. So I might just listen to it, get an overall sense of kind of the piece, and then I go straight to just hashing it out. I might go line by line. I have a piano right next to me. Sometimes I'll record a piano line and then maybe record another one on top of it to see how those fit together. I might you know, play with it myself, sing it into a recorder for pacing, then play it back to myself a week later or a couple of days later and say, oh, that pacing was all off. I need to think about this again. And so really, it's just kind of going through and learning everybody's part and then how those parts relate to each other and and really which parts to me come out and jump out as being most important, ones that need to be there to color and uh, it's, it's a lot. It's very time consuming. But for me, I love it. I, I, I'm very much a, an extroverted introvert. So okay. I like that time of being alone just with the music and, and focusing on that. Well, like an introvert, it sounds like you've opened up a thousand piece puzzle and you dump all yes. the pieces on the floor. Ex- that's and a you really see good way of thinking about what it. Is, yeah. What is here? How does this fit together? And what yep. can I, what's the end result going to be? Yes. So there's in the early stages, listening mm-hmm. to some recordings just in the very early stages. But do you also do research like on the time period or what was oh, happening? Oh, definitely. And, a lot, and sometimes I even listen to other music that that composer would have been writing at the same time or maybe even researching other things that they would have been doing at that same time because it's, it's very early in their career. That kind of shapes how you might want to interpret a piece, like especially with Mozart, who started out very, very, you know, in the classical age. But by the end, some of his pieces were more mature than even Beethoven's early works. So for me, it's kind of seeing that progression of 
where they are in their compositional output and trying to also think about what happened in the world during that time. Like if it's a barber, is this just after World War II? And so he's feeling like in the Barber Violin Concerto, all of these effects and terribleness of war and how that's coming out in his music. And, and the same with somebody like Shostakovich, where so much of his music is, is affected by Soviet regime and Soviet oppression. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into affecting how you personally interpret Definitely. a single piece. So m- maybe months later, you've listened to it a few times, you've um, sung it into a recorder, gotten upset about how it sounded a week <laughs> later. And as how does it, as it's coming together, is it kind of like, a, as you were saying, comparing it to food, now you're getting more of a sense of what this dish is? Have you? Yeah, I always try to, and, and kind of like a puzzle, being able to look at the at the front cover of the box and seeing the big picture I always try to have the big picture in my mind, but my favorite thing about score study is finding the details and what the little details you can bring out to really make it sparkle or really make the piece kind of shine in certain in certain ways. And, and in some ways, you find that out uh, while you're rehearsing because – as a conductor, I always feel like it needs to be a collaborative experience with musicians. And a lot of times, the musicians obviously have all of their own ideas about how pieces should go. So I might be bringing something out and hear just a beautiful viola section and kind of want to bring out that lovely color that this particular viola section in this particular symphony has. And so that's what's great. I might do Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in five different places. And even though I'm the same person, the orchestra is different. And for that reason, the music's going to be different in those five different places, which I think is what makes art in the musical form so great, is that you're going to go see the Mona Lisa. It's always going to be the Mona Lisa. You might come to it with different perspectives each time, but it, it, as the painting, is always the same. But with music, every single time you hear it live or every single time it's performed live, even with the same orchestra on subsequent nights or subsequent days, there's always going to be a little bit thing that is different. And I think that's the best part for me is being able to play with that and play within the lines. So we'll get to the rehearsal part and what happens there. But <laughs> still in this early stage, I'm wondering what, like, what is, if there is even a typical day, what is that like? Like, how many hours are you sitting alone in this room, as you said? Sure. Well, it used to be a lot more uh, before I had my son, who's about two years old now. It's been maybe, you know, seven or eight hours a day. Now I have to be even more uh Uh, diplomatic with my time. So I tend to get about four to five hours a day uh, while he's at school or with, you know, somebody that else is watching him. And, you know, on good days, if I need a little bit more time, maybe six hours. Uh, But just it is. It's just sitting, looking at the music, silently playing it in your head and thinking about the different ways that you can imagine the sound. Like I might imagine the tuba entrance, for example, since that's your instrument, uh, how I want that initial attack to be, the attack being the start of the note, or how I want it to, the the music or the note to actually blossom or grow, or if I don't want it to blossom or grow, and actually just thinking about the different ways the musicians make sound and how I might want that to be in my own head. It's like looking at um, a photograph, like a negative of a photograph. You have this very detailed image. And whereas most people could hear maybe if there's a wrong note, if I if I'm listening, I have an idea of how lengths of notes I want to sound, durations of notes, even though it's written it's it's up for interpretation sometimes. And so I've got I'm trying to make this overall picture in my head of how I think the music sh- music should go so that when I'm actually hearing it played back to me, I can then uh, make comments to to hopefully make it have that overall picture that we want it to have. I don't think I've heard a conductor talk about that detailed with a tuba instrance. <laughs> We yeah. Oh, yeah. We definitely. don't. Sometimes it doesn't seem like we're thought about much at all. But anyway, I like to think about the forgotten instruments of the orchestra. I didn't sometimes. say it was forgotten, <laughs> but but um, and I hear that from a lot of friends who um, are musicians and have kids. It makes you incredibly 
efficient. Yes. What, what you were doing in four hours, like, well, I figured out I can do it in two. Yes. And, and you start to f- you figure out how much you, you might daydream a little bit and start thinking about other. Actually, a lot of times I'll start thinking about another piece and be like, no, you have to focus back on this one. And I actually try to write out sometimes detailed schedules like you can spend one hour on this. You can spend another hour on that. And you have to get as much done as you can. And in a way, it's great because it you know, Yo-Yo Ma was famous for saying you can over rehearse things and you can over study things and then you lose kind of that magic in the moment of doing it. And I think in some ways having my son and having to be more efficient has made me in some ways a better musician because I try to just go off of, you know, the musicality that I have in me. And, you know, when I'm with him, listening to all sorts of music, not just classical, but listening. We've been listening to the Wood Brothers a lot lately and uh, other bluegrass artists and jazz as musicians, Brad Meldow is one of our favorites, and just f- finding the musicality of those musicians actually helps influence my own uh, taste in music, my own way that I like to turn a line or things like that. So it's been it's been great. Is there something that you also do maybe on this typical day where you've studied the scores, you're studying the music, playing the piano? Is there something else that you do that's not music related but kind of pairs with that in the sense of? taking that break that you need, scheduling that hour. I don't know, for some people it's running or reading. Or... Oh, I, I definitely, for me, especially if I'm trying to work out a problem, be it musically or something related to being a music director, which is a totally different side of the conductor's job, uh, running without headphones. I never in my life have ran with headphones because I like to have a clear head and try to sort things out when I'm on a, on a long run. It's it's the greatest thing in the world to me. The only problem with that is sometimes I'll get a, whatever I'm working on in my head and it tends to go at the tempo that my feet are going and it's never the same. So no. that can always be annoying. <laughs> but other than that, it, running is, is my favorite thing to do. Um, and I try to do it, you know, four or five times a week to get out and clear my head and, you know, think about things that are going on. So now it's time for the rehearsal. What happens? What is there something like the day the day of or maybe days before that changes as you're leading up to the rehearsal? Once it's a couple of days before, I'm trying to just be strictly in review mode. Um you know, uh, there are famous stories though of Carlos Kleiber, really one of my most I think respected conductors for many, many people these days, uh in that he was in the middle of even performances and somebody was trying to go back to his dressing room and uh, they said, oh, you can't, he's studying. And they said, he's studying music for next week? No, no, he's studying the music for this. And they said, well, what else could he find? And he said, yeah, there's always something new. So I always try to keep that in my head that in the review process, don't be limited by the idea that you have for the music. If something jumps out at you, go with that. And that can happen in the days leading up to the rehearsal. That can happen in rehearsal. It might even happen sometimes in the concert where something new has popped out at you and you want to highlight that. But for me, I'm trying to go back to that, uh, the front box of the puzzle and seeing it from the macro perspective with all the lovely details that are inside. If you don't have kind of the arc of where we're beginning, where we're going and where we're ending, I feel that it can all just be a, a lot of beautiful little moments, but not something that is uh, satisfying as a whole. So for me, I try to take a step back and really try to see it as as the piece that the composer wrote. Uh, again, comparing it to art, when you see a piece of art, you see it all at once, and then you're taking it all in. With music, it's laid out for us in time. I think somebody said, um, art decorates space, music is what decorates time. And I think that's such a beautiful statement and sentiment, and that as a conductor, as one of my primary jobs being to dictate the pace and the speed and the flow of a piece, I have to make sure that that makes sense and is uh, congruent with what the composer hopefully desired. So you're standing in front of the orchestra and you have this image, this idea of what this piece is. How do you then start the rehearsal and 
communicate that? So a lot of times, especially with a with a full symphony, I like to do the whole thing. Uh, most of the time, run the whole symphony. And I think for one, especially with an orchestra I've never been before, it helps me get to know them, them get to know me. Every conductor has a different way of coming off of a downbeat, coming coming into a downbeat. Um, so, And I think that helps the whole orchestra see the arc that I have in my head of the piece. And then we go back and kind of work the detail moments. And, you know, if we've gone through Beethoven's, to use Beethoven's symphony again, Beethoven's fifth, going back to the first movement and then kind of really getting into the nitty gritty of those different motifs and, of course, those famous four notes. And I like what you said right from the start, which a lot of, of course, non-musicians don't know, running through the piece first, especially if you're a new conductor, running through it, not stopping after 15 seconds. We've all been there. (laughs) You're sitting there and it's like, so this is how it's going to be. Yeah. Oh, yes. This is how it's well, be. I think part of what's so great is I'm married to a professional musician as well. And so I've heard the stories of what not to do as a conductor, which is, as you said, stop and talk. And musicians want to play music. And I think, you know, one of the another one of the most wonderful conductors, uh, Bernard Hytink, he was so famous for he could show so much just with his hands or just with his eyes, and he would run the piece. And sometimes that's what you need is to feel it and to all be there doing it together and words just get in the way. And so I try to remind myself that you can say things and you can talk, but try to use as few words, do in two words what you thought you had to use 10 words for. And I think that's something I try to live by that doesn't always come out. (laughs) But hopefully as I get older, I will get wiser in that regard. One time working with Maurice Janssens, we were playing Strauss, um, also Sprach's Artustra. And in the orchestra, the orchestra hadn't played in a very long time. Like very few people raised their hand who have actually played it together. Uh-huh. And we've all played it separately, but, you know, as a group. And so we started the rehearsal. He didn't say a thing the entire rehearsal, but you knew exactly, exactly what he wanted, where he wanted it. And if something wasn't how maybe he wanted it to be, you knew then already from what he was giving you mm-hmm. how to do it the next time. Yeah. And then the second rehearsal, he said a couple of things at most. And it's something magical about that, being a musician, and it's just a different kind of playing even yeah. with someone where it's just more organic. And that's and it is almost magical. There's the moments, and I remember my teacher telling this when I was a student. He said, the moment that you feel that you can communicate without having to say a word is it's uplifting it's it's energizing it's it's like you can do anything because you have this oneness with the orchestra you're all working together and and you're just making music you're not stopping to make words you're making music which is what all of you got into the profession for so using Beethoven's Fifth Symphony as an example and you run through it then you go back to say the opening movement to Um, Think about how things can be done either differently than the first time. How do you go about communicating that? Is it always do you just say, hey, can we slow down here? Can we speed up here? This kind of thing. Or do you just go back to it and then try to make it more obvious with your gestures? I think both. I think first I try to just do it again and see if I can get everybody's attention with the difference of speed. And of course, with uh, Beethoven's fifth, with the da-da-da-da, there's so many ways you can do that. I think there's YouTube videos of those first four notes being done in a variety of different speeds. Oh, yes. And it's all different. The pitches. <laughs> and it's all different pitches. The pitch is it's completely from different. Different, <laughs> different orchestras and different different A440, A442, and, and that's uh, very, And we'll definitely have that video on the show notes page oh, at classicalbreakdown.org. <laughs> But um, so it's a combination of it's both. a combination. You're, I'm hoping that I'm not going to have to stop and say, no, no, uh, you know, cellos, we're, we're, you're just not getting going fast enough off of that rest. We've got to do that. And sometimes sometimes that's necessary to just draw everybody's attention to the, the thing that's actually um, not happening. But hopefully and there's actually sometimes that I'll just change the way that I'm conducting and it fixes things. Like, and I'll realize, oh, they need me to show it with this gesture as opposed to this other gesture. Whereas, you know, I might flick the baton 
um, one way, you know, this is the Lev Guardia. What is what is it that Hermione says when Ron's trying to uh, in Harry Potter do some spell, but she does it, of course, the perfect way. It's a little bit like that, where you're trying to figure out how you need to move your hands, move the baton, flick it in certain ways, or be soft with your touch in certain ways to get the sound again that I've been thinking of that tuba entrance. If I want the tuba to come in very hard and sharp, it's a different way that I actually show that gesture physically than if I want it to be this kind of soft or even timid entrance. It's going to be a completely different gesture. And so I I have kind of this uh, magician's bag of tricks these days, but when I was younger, I would spend, in addition to hours and hours studying music, I would spend hours and hours uh, in front of a mirror or recording myself practicing different gestures, different ways to make sound. What I would like to know is when you give a gesture, say, to me playing tuba, I'm like 40, 50 feet away or something like that. Violins and violas, yeah. cellos, they're literally a couple of feet from you. Yeah. Is what you do for us in the back row different? Sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes, especially for entrances uh, in the trumpets or the trombones, if they have a big you know, fanfare coming up, I'll even cue it a split second early mm-hmm. so that it comes. And, and sometimes... You don't want to have to say, oh, you're late. You know, that gets annoying after a while to be like, you're late, you're late. But if I I find that if I notice it and then I do a little bit different thing with my gesture, either by going a little earlier, just maybe giving a look, a little cue with my eyebrow early, that it can fix everything. And it's just that kind of awareness of of how the sound's coming in. But I think that's something that people don't realize is that it sounds completely different in the front of an orchestra than it does in the back of an orchestra oh, yeah. or on the left side of an orchestra as compared to the right side of the orchestra. And that's uh, that's what makes making music all together somewhat difficult is you have to learn how to listen to each other and know if you're a violin player, hey, maybe I should listen back to the xylophone player during this Porgy and Bess lick that is super hard so that we can all be together as opposed to making them listen to me because I'm way here in the front. So, And as a conductor, you also have to be uh, kind of like a middle ground problem solver too because there's times where maybe the pitch is just not right between sure. one instrument and another. Maybe they're in the same section, but maybe they're completely removed from, from each other. Yeah. yeah, and so they may not even, depending on what's happening in the music, not even hear each other. Exactly, and it might not even know that, oh, I, the tuba player's with the, I keep using tuba, tuba player's with the piccolo That's in a good this example. one section. It is, it's a great example. <laughs> but um, so a lot of times, and that is such a sticky area because pitch is very uh, personal to people, and you don't want to ever... You never want to make an environment where people feel uncomfortable to play. And so for me, a lot of times I like to deal with that by just highlighting the moment. You know, we were just – with my orchestra, we were just doing um, Ravel's Mother Goose Suite. And it's just just such lovely music, but it has such difficult woodwind writing and, and harmonics with the strings. And I think sometimes just slowing it down and isolating, say, maybe the flutes and the clarinets or the flutes and the oboes and clarinets just so they can have a chance to listen to it all together. Not every time can people stay after rehearsal and say, hey, let's play this passage together once slowly so we can hear the pitches and how we need to change. And sometimes in rehearsal, I'll do that. I'll, I'll give them a chance to just play through it without all the other string players playing, without anybody else doing anything so that they can focus and, and, and do the job themselves. Professional musicians n- most of the time know w- what they need to do to fix it. They just need the opportunity to do it together. Exactly. And that's what's sometimes if a, a conductor is, is maybe new or still in school or maybe they don't play an orchestral instrument. And when you're in the orchestra and there's a wrong note, everyone knows there's a wrong note. If something's out of tune, yeah. you know, you're dying inside. <laughs> you're, you're crippling inside because you yes. hear it out of tune. And, you know, it's, if it's not fixed in a fraction of a second, it seems like eternity. Yeah. Um, so musicians are very good at also you know, resolving these issues, hopefully yes. before the conductor has to. Of course. Get in. And, and you, you speak to a wrong note. It, 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 they happen every now and then. And I feel like as a conductor, if you're going to make a frown, why are you doing this job? Like everyone makes mistakes. You're making music. You're not performing surgery and you didn't just cut the main artery. Right. It's all going to be fine. And most people aren't going to know. I mean, 
lay people wouldn't know that it's even happening anyway. And most of the time that's happening in rehearsal. It might be transposing, which means you're trying to figure out um, how to play on your instrument, the key of a different instrument. But uh, it's, it's, it's all making music together and figuring out how to do this to the best of your ability. So for me, it's so much better when it's kind of a positive environment, uh, a collaborative environment. So if there's a soloist on the concert, mm -hmm. do you um, communicate with them beforehand? I think a lot of people don't know that most oftentimes a soloist is not there at the first rehearsal. Yeah. They're there for just at the end to sit down and make sure everything's okay. A lot of times that's true. And I, I do. I like to see if I don't have a chance to meet with them in person before, sometimes I'll even arrange a Skype interview so that we can talk over the phone about how they're – uh, taking certain passages because for me my main thing is needing to keep the orchestra with the soloist and uh, so I will sometimes have them play through the whole piece for me if it's a more well-known piece we might just go over certain corners places that might have tricky spots for me to catch and for the orchestra to catch but I love talking with the soloist because I like to. I feel like the conductor takes a, a little bit of a back seat when there's a soloist on the program because we want to make them shine to the best of the ability. And really, um, if they're an established soloist, they have uh, such spent so much time thinking about how they want their piece to sound that I want to honor that and go with that interpretation. Sometimes, if it's younger soloists or people that are just starting out, we might have a discussion like, "Why don't you think about doing it this way?" or "What if we did this?" Uh, and and I think that's great because again, it's kind of this collaboration collaborative effort between conductor and soloist, and then ultimately conductor, soloist, and orchestra. So if you're with the orchestra, and there's, say, three rehearsals, um, and that first rehearsal, you're getting to know each other, you're playing through the piece, going over some specifics, and then what's, do things change as you get to the third, and the say, the third and the final rehearsal? I, I say, I think it's exactly that. By the time you're at the second rehearsal, that's where you're, just as my score study prep, process, you're getting to the details. You're doing the detail work. Uh, you're bringing out certain parts that m might not have been communicated just in a, a general run. You're fixing really tricky passages uh, that just need a little bit more time of hearing all together as an ensemble. And then it goes back to kind of that macro where near the end you're doing fuller runs, you're you're hearing what it sounds like now that you've worked on that detail work, and then you're taking a step back to see this creation. I think one big kind of characteristic about conductors that we haven't mentioned so far is that, well, I musicians love conductors with good time management. Oh, yes. Yeah. So how not does that... Not wasting time. Right. Not wasting time, whether that's with stories that are irrelevant or not as funny, you know, as, you know, maybe you thought they were. But for you, how is it... Because you want to stay on time of with course. everything. You know, breaks have to be at a very certain time. Um, how do you manage that? Is there, is there anything kind of maybe something that we wouldn't know? Hmm. Because I imagine you might be conducting and then you look up at the clock and you see you have five minutes, but really you'd like maybe 20. Oh, of course. For some things, there can always be more times. There's always things that you can work on more. But yeah, with time management, I, I do try to, you know, glance at the clock throughout the rehearsal and just kind of see where I am so that I can time breaks and time whenever we need to move on to certain spots in the music. It, it's it's always the worst when you're near the end of the piece and say you're you're getting to this climax and then you either don't get to the climax because the time runs out or you don't get to the resolution. And so everyone's with, left with this feeling of, oh, oh, that was kind of a letdown. Yeah. And, um, and so I do try to keep mind of the clock and uh, and just make sure we're getting good music done and not and I think another thing that's important is it's like you said not veering off topic not doing too much making sure that you're really just there to make music you're not there to be you know public entertainer number one and you're there to 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 help this music come alive and come off the page. So a year ago, the orchestra contacts you, you debate and you create this program, you've got the music, you study it for hours on end, day after day after day, revising, going back and forth, I'm sure. Rehearsals start happening, you get to the third one, now it's time for the concert, mm -hmm. which um, is sometimes even the same day as that 
um, last rehearsal. Sometimes, yeah. Um, and but also other days. But now that we've come to the concert, what happens then? It's the day of. Is there something? Um, special or rituals that or I do anyone oh. yeah or you um I think it's I think on concert days I like to always kind of take it easy especially if there's been a rehearsal a lot of times the dress rehearsal will happen in the morning say from 10 to 12 30 and then you'd have an evening concert at 8 p.m if that's happening I definitely have to get a nap in between, just so that I'm at my my freshest and I'm at my, you know, most most capable self. And I think, you know, having a nice good lunch after rehearsal and then I never eat before a concert. I might have a couple of almonds and grapes or something like that. But I hate to eat before concerts because I don't want to feel, you know, burdened down by any heaviness. And it's always fun to go out to eat after a concert. Right. <laughs> um, but... I think, like I said before, for me, the rehearsal is where most of my work is taking place, and the concert is where I get to have fun and play. And and so I get really excited for concert nights. There is a different energy because you have an audience now, and different audiences bring different energies to the music, and you can kind of feed off that a little bit. And this is not talking about kind of the, the showmanship that some conductors do, kind of being overly flamboyant just for the audience's sake. No, it's more about how they're perceiving the music or how long I'm going to hold a fermata, whether or not the audience is sitting there on bated breath or whether they seem like they're ready to go out and have dinner themselves um, and kind of feeling that and and playing with their emotions as well um, so that, the, the again, the piece is, is coming off to the best of its ability. It's always strange when you get to a concert and you sit down and the conductor starts conducting and it's like, well, who was this person? <laughs> sure. Who was, where was, this person wasn't at rehearsal. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for concerts, it's it seems like it's just take a nap. Eat something light. You don't want to be sleepy, you know. Yeah. As you're as you're as you're going. And you on don't stage. necessarily want to have coffee and take all the tempos twice as fast as right. you wanted to. But what's it like as you're you know the concert master walks on? They tune the orchestra. You know the lights are down at half. Mm -hmm. You know what is it like for you? You know on the side waiting. It's there's a lot of anticipation, and especially it's if it's right before the first performance, um, it's different. Especially if if you have multiple concerts, because right before the first performance, there's a lot of you know uh, anticipation, uh, looking forward to doing the program and how how it's going to come off with the audience, how it's going to be now that you're getting you know a full unstopped run completely with the orchestra where you you know if you stopped and started talking in the middle of a concert that would just be just completely taboo so just just actually going out there with your fellow colleagues and uh, doing art together and having this joint experience and I think for me that's part of what it is is that you know it's uh who always says, is it Jay-Z? It says, that's church. You know, it's like when you're really on fire yeah. and you're, uh, you're, you're there together and you're doing this experience, you're hoping that it's going to be, yes, for the audience, but for you as well and for the musicians, that you're just really enjoying creating something together in the moment. And now going back to multiple concerts, it's normally that second concert or if there's four concerts, that second and third concert, they're the hardest to, to pull off because it's – it's the second time for the orchestra to play it. It's not the final time. So me, people might be coming in with a little bit less energy and finding ways to um, to still keep that energy going or still keep that that magic, as you put it earlier, going. And actually, I it's more often happening, I think, in opera. And I remember watching a, a, a video uh, of Carlos Kleiber again of this huge, long opera run he had. And he started coming in dressed up as different characters for the second half where he was bouncing a tennis ball on his racket just to, you know, kind of surprise the musicians and get them to look up and kind of have a, a little chuckle. And then, you know, you're, you're just kind of your, – your head's in a different space and, right. you're, and you're ready to ready to do something. So, you know, I might do something like that on a second or third no, night, you know, get try to get somebody's attention just with my eyes and, you know, give a little wink or a little smile and, and try – Try to again make it make it an experience, not just like oh here we go, gotta punch the time card and go into work again. But no, make it this living thing. And that's what you want to avoid having it being like a time card, which you know it's music, but it can still happen like that. Oh yes, yeah. And um, 
you don't want to lose the magic that is the concert because for a lot, a lot of audiences don't know, if I'm going on stage to play, if I'm nervous or if I'm anxious, it's not for, no offense, the audience. Yeah, it's, it's for not that you. at all. It's for me. It's for the musicians I'm I'm with. Yeah. So we need to play in a way that satisfies us musically and artistically, yeah. the conductor, the musicians, because if we don't like it, yeah. How, why, why would the audience why like would the it? audience like and actually I uh, when I was in college I was studying actually with an uh, Indian Bansuri which is like the Indian flute East East Indian I mean I was studying with this Indian who was kind of a, a not a scholar I wouldn't say it a scholar but he was a really great Bansari player and I remember him telling me once I was about to go out and do a performance with him and and a, and a couple of other people just kind of a recital I guess of his students if you will and he said you'll know if it's good. People might come up and tell you, oh, that was great, but you'll know whether it was really good or not. And I just, that struck me so hard. And I thought, wow, that is something. Because so, of course, so many people will come up and be like, oh, what a wonderful concert. That was such a great show. That was great. But you know whether it felt good or not. Right. And every musician knows yes. that we were on fire tonight. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what really matters is what it feels like inside for you and that you gave it your all and you gave it, you know, the best that you could. And and it is, if we make a little mistake or anything like that, or maybe I, I, I turned a phrase, you know, a little bit wrong that, that, that I anticipated I would. Oh, you'll, you'll kill yourself for that. You'll just go home and think about that all night long yeah. or something I do. And I am guilty of that. And, you know, wanting to correct that for the next performance or the next time you do it. <laughs> It's the one thing where it happens and it's over. It's over. Even recordings, as they can be amazing, and they are. Yeah. But it's not the experience of of being in that live concert. And out of all these thousands of hours, these rehearsals, these concerts, we've not talked about, you know, actually conducting, mm-hmm. beating your hands around, <laughs> yes. because that is a, a small fraction. Yes. Of, oh, you know, the pe- smallest part of my job. Is people that. don't realize, you know, the orchestra can play. No offense, without the conductor, oh, of course they, they can. can. You know. And there's there's many chamber orchestras that do. Uh, and there's even that. It, it, maybe you can put this in the show notes. That famous thing of Bernstein, after doing the full performance of Haydn's 88th Symphony, going back as an encore and doing the finale with just his eyebrows. Oh yes, and it's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, and of course, Bernstein is a showboat, but he's a fantastic musician, and he knows that his musicians are fantastic musicians. So he's having a little bit of fun with this, and just showing that, look how wonderful that they can play, and I'm just going to have a little fun with it myself. And he doesn't lift up his hand at all, nope. just gives him little winks, little smile, little eyebrow lift there. And it's mag- it's it magical. Is. It it's is. wonderful. And, and I think that's something to remember is that Hopefully at the end of the day, of course I'm there to make sure, and any conductor is there to make sure that we play together, that we have a vision for the piece. But hopefully, hopefully I am there and can inspire people to their best self and, 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 and bring us all together for this experience to make magic and to make the magic happen and not just to clock in and go to work and, you know, get business done, but to bring out the best in all of us and and make something really special, not only for the audience, but for us in that period of time. Wonderful. All right, let's take a break. And then when we come back, we'll hear about your path to becoming a conductor. Classical Breakdown is made possible by Classical WETA. Join us for the music anytime, day or night. To listen live, just go to our website, classicalweta.org, or download our app. It's free in the App Store. So, Michelle, now you're flying around and you're conducting different orchestras, but that didn't just happen overnight. Very true. Um, you're, uh, as a musician, what instrument do you play? Saxophone. I did not know that. <laughs> I know. I knew you would be shocked. Not shocked. <laughs> Which is a very odd instrument for an orchestral conductor. Okay. So- have played. Now, I started on piano. I, I was about seven or eight, and I was trick-or-treating. And uh, the lady that was handing out her candy bars had her business card on it. And I dumped out the candy when I got home and said, yeah, I want to play piano. Let's do that. And so my parents got me a little Casio, eventually an old upright. And I loved it. I mean, I never had to be told to practice. I was playing piano all the time. 
Um, you know, my friends would want me to go to Six Flags or some other amusement park and I would be practicing. Um, and, and it was my sister, who is eight years older than me, who played saxophone. And I grew up in this very, very tiny town called Canton, Texas, it's spelled C-A-N-T-A-O-N. So you would think Canton, but no, it's East Texas. So we say Canton. And uh, 2,000 people. I graduated with 100 people in my class. So my parents weren't musicians. I didn't know that saxophone wasn't going to be, you know, an orchestra. I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking, I want to be like my big sister. I want to play saxophone. And so that's the instrument that I chose. And uh, again, loved it. Never had to be told to practice. Was practicing all the time, trying to be the best I could. I did a little jazz, but I was mainly focused on the classical side of things. Um, I remember going, this is more than you asked, but I'll I'll go with it. Uh, I remember going to SMU, which is where I got my undergrad from in saxophone performance and uh, just walking around because it was in Dallas and just, you know, a huge city compared to mine and just walking around at the uh, Central Market at 2 a.m. looking at all the cheese that they had, just being amazed that there was something besides cheddar. And, you know, so this little girl in the big city, but uh, being with these incredible musicians, I was the only saxophone besides another freshman in the school at that time that was a saxophone player. And so I got to play a lot of the big rep my first year with orchestra, La Arlesienne Suite by Bizet, and uh, picture, the big solo and pictures at an exhibition. And I remember those first rehearsals in orchestra just being in awe of how wonderful it was and just loving every minute. And, um, and, and it probably was that that shaped me a little bit in kind of wanting to be an orchestral musician and kind of being like, well, I get to play with the orchestra more. And uh, unfortunately, the saxophone is not a part of the orchestra on a general basis. And um, But I, I did as much as I could with saxophone, but knew that I, I loved being in front of the orchestra and making music with everybody. I don't think you get a lot of musicians' origin stories starting with, well, I was trick-or-treating. Exactly. And then I was at the cheese counter at 2 a.m. Yeah, yeah. To now I'm working with orchestras. Yes. So you were at um, SMU for mm-hmm. saxophone performance, and then it kind of clicked for you to, to be I, a conductor? I was actually saxophone performance and music education. So I had a double degree, and so I did all of the things for a performance major, but then also did all the things for an education major um, because I thought, oh, I want to go I want to go teach. I want to be a music teacher. And so I was. that's what first got it me started learning all the other instruments. So you're not learning them to a professional level, but you're getting an idea of how the other instruments are working. Um, You're seeing how things fit together, how, you know, different, different instruments have different specialties and things like that. And, uh, and I also started taking private conducting lessons with one of the wind ensemble conductors there at the time and was getting introduced to things by Messiaen and Varese and, you know, kind of exploring the different new music side of things and just started really enjoying studying music at that point. I, you know, of course, I was, you know, studying my own pieces, but I really started to enjoy studying scores at that point. And then I was lucky enough to right after that, get on the League of American Orchestras website, which is kind of like a a big organization for orchestral musicians, and saw that there was an opening for an apprentice conductor in northeastern Pennsylvania. And I wrote my teacher at the time, Paul Phillips, and said, do you know Lawrence Lowe? And I knew that name had sounded familiar to me. And it was because at one time, Larry Lowe was the assistant conductor in Dallas. And so he said, oh, I, I do. He said, I'll send him an email. And so through that and through kind of my audition tape and, and some other things, I got invited to an audition with the Northeastern Pennsylvania Philharmonic and ended up winning the job. And kind of the rest is history. I was an apprentice conductor with Larry for a year. Um then was promoted to his assistant, was able to do lots of different shows, not only classical, but pops and education and family, which Larry is just a genius at. And I kind of learned to, uh, that that side of a conductor's job when you're doing the fun concerts. And, and you don't always have to be, you know, so stiff and so serious. You can have fun with the kids and you can dress up and you can make jokes with the audience when you're trying to get kind of a lighter, a lighter concert feel. And actually through that, uh, Detroit was losing their assistant conductor, Teddy Abrams, who had just gotten a job with the Louisville Orchestra. Larry Lowe had a connection with Leonard Slatkin, whom he had worked with a little bit in Pittsburgh, sent him an email, said, I think you should consider 
uh, Michelle for, you know, a possible replacement. I get an email the next day from their artistic administrator uh, asking me to come for the audition. I was one of eight for that audition in Detroit, won that job, and 12 days later had to show up in Detroit and kind of uproot my whole life, which was a crazy uh glorious mess and uh, and was there in Detroit for four years and loved every minute. And now I'm kind of off doing my own thing with music directorship in Georgia, about an hour north of Jacksonville where I live, which is completely serendipitous. That never happens that you get to get a job right, right where you live, especially where your husband lives. And, um, and also just guest conducting around the world and the country. So I think that was way more than you asked. But, <laughs> but what, I, what I love is how it's just it's, you know, grinding, 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 less and less and less. And, oh, this is nice. I, yeah. this, I'm, I'm, I'm now kind of in this new, uh, you know, entry role. And then all of a sudden, overnight, it's I'm moving to Detroit. And yeah. less than two weeks later, you're in front of, you know, one of the greatest orchestras in the country. Oh, yeah. So as an assistant conductor, what is your role? What do you do? Sure. So as an assistant, you're really there um, to first and foremost, be a cover conductor, which is like being an understudy in the theater. So I'm learning all of the music that the conductor, the main conductor is learning for that week and making sure that I have it prepared so that at a moment's notice, I can go and step up and step in for him or her and either run the rehearsal or run the con or do the concert. Um, but in addition to that, I'm also an extra set of ears in the audience. So um, sometimes on stages, you can't hear necessarily the same way that you might hear in the audience. Certain halls are built in ways where just certain things pop out in certain places. Uh, and so I might move around the hall. I might be in a certain spot and notice, wow, the trumpets sound really hot or the, the horns are really kind of soft right here. And then I will relay that information back to the conductor and um, just try to try to help them if they ask a question about like, hey, did this come off? Could you hear the temple block? Um, were the violas too loud there? And just give them kind of feedback on, on those instances. It's always kind of funny when you see the conductor turn around and then sometimes a very blank, scared look on this assistant <laughs> conductor's face yes. and they have to come up with something to say. Hopefully they're paying attention so right. that they have something to say. <laughs> or it's it, it's great. Yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. Well, and what I always try to do is like if I was running this rehearsal, what would I think of right now so that I'm not caught off or I wouldn't be caught off guard by right. that. Right. <laughs> like you said, be prepared. Of course. Be prepared. <laughs> so it sounds like a, a the path for conductors, it's very – I mean kind of like musicians, it's still – it's very individualistic. You're studying and very grinding, much. but how you kind of pop out um, happens, you know, a different – for everyone, of course. Yeah. It's not – you know, I go on to, I don't know, whatever the websites are where you put your resume on. You don't do that. It's not monster.com. Right. No. Mon yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's It doesn't work like that. No. So I have some rapid fire questions. Just okay, a few. Okay, shoot. Um, and of course, you have to answer with your gut. Whatever it okay. is, you know, your gut. Uh oh, okay. this is so, scary. No, no, it's easy. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, so what is the first piece you ever conducted? Oh, Peter Maxwell Davies. I cannot remember the name of it. Oh, my gosh, that's terrible. It was this small little chamber piece that had a guitar and a couple of strings and a couple of winds and one percussionist with, like, shaking cans that had beans in it. My goodness, I can't remember the name of it. Well, it doesn't – that's, that, that's the okay. But the first piece I conducted with orchestra was this piece by Emmanuel de, uh, de uh, Sejourné, uh, a marimba concerto, and it was for the concerto winners of the school. They had had a concerto competition, and a marimba player had won. And actually, my professor, Dr. Paul Phillips, was supposed to conduct it, but he had fallen, and his head was in one of those kind of iron grip things. And okay. so I wasn't even in his program yet, but he asked me to come in and kind of help out his current grad student to do that. So my very first orchestral piece was, appropriately, since I'm married to a percussionist, a piece for percussion and there orchestra. You go. <laughs> Your least favorite piece to conduct? Oh, oh, that's I. I don't even have a gut response. Let me try. I'm trying to get it out. Ah, this is horrible. The first one that comes to mind. Smetna. Why? I don't know. I think I'm just not. I I haven't connected to him yet. Okay. I need to find my connection for him. So, who's your favorite composer? Oh, I love the Russians. Shostakovich, Prokofiev, any day of the week. Uh, favorite time period? Romantic and modern. I mean, I... I like 1800s to now? Oh, yeah, definitely. Maybe 1850s to now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, favorite concert hall? I assume. Oh, Detroit. Yeah, Detroit's great. But I was just in Iceland, 
and Harpa, Eldberg and Harpa, is the best concert hall I've been in since Detroit. And and I'm not going to say it's better than Detroit. It's different, but it was beautiful. But it's it's got to be Orchestral Hall. It's just and it which is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. Right. <laughs> um, craziest moment on stage. <laughs> there was one time I was conducting a show, and uh, the librarians had gotten my music for me, and I'd handed it to them kind of in a rush. And in the middle of the concert, my W-2 that had just been handed to me was in the middle of my score, which I just found really, really funny to see in the middle of a concert. So I had a little chuckle and put it away. <laughs> What's your favorite piece to conduct? Mm. You know, I've only done it a couple of times. I love Messiah which is not in the time frame that I told you was my favorite, but it's, it's, it's just glorious music. And I, I, love, I love working with chorus um, on pieces. And actually, uh, Shostakovich IV, I might not ever get to conduct that piece again in my life because it requires so many musicians. So I think it was really a once-in-a-lifetime thing, but my goodness, there's so much, so much to unpack in that piece. Last one. What musician, what instrument on stage is the best judge of a conductor? <laughs> wow. You're going to get r- very different responses from very different people. Well, I have the right one, so. Oh, <laughs> the tuba? I think it's tuba. Really? Because people know when you play the tuba, you're sitting a lot. Oh, you're sure. You're counting rests. <laughs> um, Steve Demain from National Symphony uh-huh. said it brilliantly a few weeks ago. He said... Um, the tuba is kind of like foul language. If you use it all the time, it doesn't really mean anything. Sure. So, you know, we sit on stage, <laughs> and I'm sitting, and I, maybe I don't play for half the symphony or more. And so for the, that hour and a half, I can sit. I listen to the orchestra. I watch the conductor. Sure. I watch how they act. Sometimes they do this grand gesture. <laughs> nothing happens. Or you can see how musicians react. I just think that there's yeah, a lot yeah. of, you know, everyone else is, you know, going back and forth from looking <laughs> at you peripherally or sure, in the music sure. and I can just sit front or back row seat <laughs> right and watch yeah but I, I I have no idea if that's true or not but that's my opinion I, li- I like that you might not be biased no <laughs> so what advice would you give to a musician or aspiring conductor today I, I tell young musicians and young musicians wanting to be conductors the first and foremost you have to be the best musician first uh, uh, that you can be and and that means on your instrument and that also means exploring music of all different styles you know listen to the best classical recordings go to recitals listen to instruments that are not your own um, make sure that you're seeking out master classes I, I I used to go to to the violin master classes the cello master classes the flute master classes to just try to hear great teachers speaking on music and how to be better um, on instruments and on pieces, and also making sure that you're listening to jazz and listening to uh, bluegrass and listening to uh, old country and listening to, you know, all different genres and types of music because there's such – Beyonce, Jay-Z, um, oh my gosh, what's the other one? Kendrick Lamar. These Kendrick Lamar. These brilliant, brilliant people that are making music that aren't in our field but are just – really, really um, thinking in things in new ways. And then on top of that, reading, going to art museums, going out in nature, spending time away from this thing that you love so that you can bring back to it other things that you love. Um, And also not being afraid to ask questions, not being afraid to um, be yourself, and uh, uh, just going out there and working working, working. It takes so much work and so much time and you have to be willing to put your nose to the grindstone. That sounds like great advice for conductors, musicians, and basically pretty much everyone. <laughs> sure. you know, stretch beyond your comfort zone yes. and just keep working at it. Well, thank you, Michelle, for shining a light on what you and what conductors do. Well, thank you, John, for having me. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown. For more information about Michelle Merrill and things we talked about in this episode, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. And if you have ideas for episodes or comments or just want to tell me why you love classical music, send me an email at classicalbreakdown at weta.org. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from Classical WETA. WETA.